Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 42nd Virtual YMCA Education Series Program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. This evening's presentation is being recorded so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it once it is posted on the IBJI and NSYMCA websites. I am pleased to reintroduce Michael Q, MD, an Illinois Bone and Joint Institute Sports Fellowship trained and board certified orthopedic sports medicine surgeon specializing in advanced non-surgical treatment to minimally invasive arthroscopic surgery of the hip, knee, shoulder, and elbow using cutting edge techniques in tender, tendon repair, complex ligament reconstruction, cartilage restoration, and joint preservation. If you're an avid follower of this series, you might remember that Dr. Q taught us this, the ins and outs of hip arthroscopy in our 20th IBJI NSYMCA education series program a couple of years ago. Tonight, we welcome him back to introduce the exciting field of regenerative medicine. What is regenerative medicine? Well, the cartilage restoration that I mentioned Dr. Q specializes in might be one type of regenerative medicine, but I am no expert, so I will leave the answering to him. However, I would like to share a bit more about Dr. Q with you before he takes over. What you need to know that he is, one, is that he is one smart guy, graduating magna cum laude from Loyola University, Chicago, obtaining his Doctor of Medicine degree with honors from Chicago Medical School and obtaining his orthopedic sports medicine fellowship from the University of Chicago. He is also in high demand as a team physician, having treated high school, intercollegiate, professional, international, and Olympic athletes throughout his career, including being on the team of physicians for the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears, not concurrently. He is currently the head team physician for the Schomburg Boomers, a Frontier League baseball team. Dr. Q has the experience and expertise to treat adult and pediatric athletes at all levels and draws on a full armamentarium from injury prevention and rehabilitation, performance enhancement and regenerative therapy to arthroscopic or open surgery when needed. To complement his medical expertise, he has the personal background to understand the competitive drive of an athlete, having played on and later coached an Illinois State Championship High School varsity soccer team. Whether considering the needs of the weekend warrior or the professional athlete, Dr. Q believes it is important to talk with his patients to understand their goals and the timeline in which they wish to accomplish those goals. These conversations with patients help drive the discussion about treatment plan and intervention to determine whether surgical or non-surgical is best for each as an individual. Ultimately, when he and his patients work together to achieve their goals and get them back to the healthy, active lifestyle that they desire, it is very satisfying and rewarding for Dr. Q. Regarding regenerative medicine, regarding, mm -hmm, easy for me to say, regarding regenerative medicine specifically, Dr. Q is considered an expert in the field, having been quoted in a 2019 Chicago Health Magazine article titled Regenerating Health, What Can Stem Cell and Platelet-Rich Plasma Treatments Do For You? During Dr. Q's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions for him regarding the specific topics he brings forth tonight, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the question section on your screen, and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Q immediately following his presentation. I ask that you do keep your questions general, as Dr. Q will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. In addition, I need the Q&A portion of our program to specifically relate to the regenerative medicine topics that Dr. Q addresses this evening. You may have questions outside of the realm of tonight's discussion, but we simply will not have time to address all types of regenerative medicine in the hour we have allotted. If you do have self-specific questions, please contact Dr. Q via one of the options that will be listed on the slide shown during the Q&A portion at the end of his presentation tonight. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Q, I invite you to mark your calendar for our next IBJI and YMCA Education Series program on Wednesday, August 30th at 7 p.m. Dr. Craig Phillips will discuss common handed disorders. Thank you again for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dr. Michael Q, for your time and effort in putting together this program to answer the question, what is regenerative medicine? Dr. Q, please take it from here. Thank you, Karen, for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? I sure can, so I think they can, yes. 
Okay. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Karen, again for the introduction. And thank you for being here to discuss what is regenerative medicine. I have uh, my disclosures listed on the AOS website. So at the onset, and as a sports medicine specialist who does employ regenerative medicine in my practice, I want to say that this webinar is intended to provide a big picture or 30 foot thousand view of the orthopedic landscape in regenerative medicine and is by no means meant to be exhaustive. We could be here all week discussing regenerative medicine just in orthopedics, let alone in fields like dermatology and plastic surgery. Big picture is this. Regenerative medicine is a field focusing on developing new treatments to replace or regenerate human cells, tissues, and organs in order to provide or even restore normal function due to injury, disease, defects, or aging. It is a field still in its infancy, relatively speaking, with lots of unknowns and tremendous potential. But while regenerative medicine can hold much promise, we certainly have not found the fountain of youth. Essentially, what we're trying to achieve in regenerative medicine is along this tissue engineering pathway where bioactive factors influence responding cells to lead to tissue regeneration in the body or incorporation of scaffolds, which in turn influence the production of bioactives that influence cellular progenitor cells and so on. But certainly there are bad actors in this area taking advantage of public interest, selling snake oil, so buyer beware. And when you see ads similar to this, stem cell therapy can help repair knee joint damage without the need for extensive surgery. Stem cell repair is minimally invasive treatment. Patients can typically resume most of their daily activities within days of undergoing stem cell knee repair. Stem cell knee repair can fix my knee problem without surgery or need for post-operative therapy. Sign me up, right? But please know, consumer alert, this is from the FDA website, consumer alert on regenerative medicine products, including stem cells and exosomes. None of these products have been approved for the treatment of any orthopedic conditions such as osteoarthritis, tendonitis, disc disease, tennis elbow, back pain, hip pain, knee pain, neck pain, or shoulder pain. This is because these unproven, unregulated stem cell treatments carry significant risks. Risks like reaction, uh, site reactions to dangerous and adverse events like the cell's uh, ability to multiply into inappropriate cell types or even dangerous tumors. But if you're interested in some stem cell therapy, there are ongoing clinical trials and you can visit this website to find a list of these studies. Regenerative medicine is, quote, one of the most promising new fields in, of science and medicine. This is a statement from the FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb. The area of cell therapies and their use in regenerative medicine. These new technologies, most of which are in early stages of development, hold significant promise for transformative, potentially curative treatments for some human, humanity's most troubling and intractable maladies. So what does regenerative medicine currently mean and look like in orthopedics? Regenerative medicine refers to therapies developed by, uh, obtained via, uh, therapies developed from biological or natural substances that can be used by orthopedic specialists. And these help to relieve pain and other symptoms of certain orthopedic conditions. This is inclusive of osteoarthritis and which may help delay the need for surgery enhance the body's ability to heal from a repetitive use injury, such as a ligament or tendon strain, cartilage injuries, and broken bones, and in some cases improve healing after orthopedic surgery itself. And this type of treatment, regenerative medicine in orthopedics is known as orthobiologics. And despite what you may have heard so far, current data suggests that 
orthobiologics are not structure modifying, but rather symptom modifying with little evidence that they can lead to true tissue regeneration in many instances at this time. But why are we discussing regenerative medicine here at IBGI, given the significant controversy and these warnings from the FDA? Well, first of all, there is significant public interest, and thank you all for coming tonight to hear this talk on what is regenerative medicine, and we thank you for your interest. And many patients seek out treatments in this domain. In fact, I see a good number of patients in my sports medicine practice asking about this, and sometimes that discussion is a difficult one that can lead to disappointment after patients have seen advertisements that are false or misleading. And we want to empower patients to avoid bad actors and snake oil. Secondly, orthobiologics and regenerative medicine has developed in an unregulated market in that procedures such as PRP and BMAC are allowed, not approved, under the practice of medicine by the FDA. And we're going to get into some of these later. Orthobiologics are considered under the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, known as HCTPs, and bone marrow or adipose tissue preparations are regulated under what we call Section 361 if they meet certain criteria, while PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which we'll get into later, is not considered a drug and does not require FDA approval because it is derived from one's own blood. However, the FDA does require devices used to prepare PRP to be cleared for sale. So here's the criteria under 361. And basically what this means is this, there has to be minimal manipulation of cells used homologously, meaning from the patient, not combined with certain agents and not have systemic effects. What does that basically mean according to, to the FDA? For minimal manipulation, there has to be no alteration of the original relevant characteristics of the tissue and no altering of the relevant biologic characteristics of the cells or tissue. Centrifugation, like we do in PRP preparation as we'll see, increases cell concentration and is permitted because this does not alter the relevant biological characteristics of the cell, but the cell sorting or cell culture expansion alters the cell's relevant biologic characteristics. Therefore, this is not allowed under section 361. Another important mention here is the homologous use, which allows use of orthobiologics if they are removed from and then implanted into the same individual patient during the same surgical procedure in their original form. This is known as same surgical procedure exemption. A product that does not meet 361 criteria is regulated under 351, which requires an IND, Investigational New Drug Application for Clinical Trial. Of note, perinatal products like umbilical cord, blood, amniotic membrane, and fluid can now only be used in a clinical trial under an IND since these are used in a non-homologous way and presumed to be metabolically active cells. More on this later. Okay, so let's talk more specifics about these orthobiologics. And I wanna temper this discussion stating that there are still many unknowns with major limitations in this field due to the following three. There is variability in composition and biologic activity of our orthobiologic formulations. And we need to better define the measurable markers of purity, potency, and even biologic activity. Second, many times there's variability in the characterizing of the underlying tissue pathology that we are addressing. Thirdly, there's variability in characterizing the desired biological outcome. Are we talking decreased inflammation, increased cell proliferation, increased blood flow to the healing site, increased synthesis of tissues and remodeling? Part of the reasons we are still adjusting in the field of regenerative medicine is because our history at the start in thinking about regenerative medicine therapy played a role. So the term 
Mesenchymal stem cells in orthopedic literature initially was used by Arne Kaplan in 1991, and it was intended to describe cells whose progeny could become committed to various distinct tissue pathways by following certain steps to a unique tissue type, such as cartilage, bone, muscle, et cetera, et cetera. The dogma of the day was that there was no adult stem cells except for cells that gave rise to sperm or egg and the hematopoietic stem cells, those that are in our blood uh, stream that lead to blood cells known as HSCs. But now we know that there are adult stem cells, better called progenitor cells, like neural stem cells, NSCs, cardiac stem cells, liver stem cells, etc. These cell functions in adults as sources for replacement of differentiated cells. With time, these progenitor cells naturally expire or they become injured, which leads to impairment in healing and regeneration of tissue. Later on, the term mesenchymal stem cell was further explained by the International Society of Cell Therapy based on criteria from culturing cells in a dish, which is an important point to underline since some continue to use this term inappropriately to describe in orthopedics non-culture expanded cells that we as orthopedic surgeons harvest from bone or other tissues. And so throughout this talk, MSCs do not refer to this original definition, mesenchymal stem cells, but better said mesenchymal progenitor cells. And one type, uh, one cell type in, in particular is becoming more central in this ever-changing domain of MSC science that suggests that maybe a majority of MSCs come from perivascular cells or pericytes. These are cells that sit on uh, vascular uh, structures in our body that they reside on these blood vessels in the body and they activate upon local injury. By secreting factors which mute our immune system, these MSC pericytes, they inhibit surveillance of the damaged tissue and thereby prevent autoimmune reactions from starting up. Moreover, biological agents are released by these MSCs that establish a regenerative microenvironment by inhibiting ischemia that causes cell death. They inhibit the formation of scar tissue and they stimulate blood vessel formation. And by becoming parasites once again and stabilizing newly formed blood vessels after tissue healing. This term is immune modulation and it all leads to tissue healing and plays a role in regeneration. Okay, so now that we have the basic background, here are some of the most common orthobiologics that I use or get asked about in my practice. Let's start with bone marrow aspirin. Bone marrow comprises, uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, or what I'll refer to as BMAC from now on, comprises growth factors and these MSCs, or the mesenchymal progenitor cells, that activate when immune cells like white blood cells or macrophages. Um, and they activate these to produce factors that lead to cell turnover in the body. They also produce an anti-inflammatory effect. They have this interleukin receptor antagonist protein, and this can prevent activation of inflammatory cascades in the body. BMAC is obtained generally from the iliac crest, and after we use centrifugation to remove the red blood cells, we get mesenchymal and these hematopoietic progenitor cells. BMAC can serve as a biologic adjunct to cartilage production and cartilage protection. Some animal studies have shown cartilage defects grew more normally resembling cartilage on histology and MRI when they compared this to microfracture alone. Now, what's microfracture? This is a surgical procedure that we see there in the picture on the bottom right. It's a surgical procedure where cartilage regeneration is attempted by tapping into mesenchymal progenitor cells that reside in the bone sitting behind the cartilage, or in this case, the damaged cartilage surface. So after preparation of the bone and the cartilage defect, we essentially drill 
or puncture holes in the surface to a specific depth. And there's varying uh, literature on this, whether we're uh, drilling to uh, or tapping to four millimeters or drilling to six or more. This is intended to stimulate bleeding and flow of blood and these progenitor cells that come with the blood come to the cartilage defect surface and hopefully repopulate that defect and in the end it can lead to a different type of cartilage not the normal cartilage or the articular cartilage but one called fibrocartilage that resembles a meniscus for example and still serves at least as some protection to the cartilage defect being treated so here is the video of where I perform a microfracture, similar to help with healing of a meniscus repair that we perform. All right, we're gonna let the tourniquet come down. So this is not a microfracture in a cartilage defect case, but exemplifies the same result, the marrow stimulation to help aid with healing with that egress of blood flow. BMAG benefits in the literature. It's been shown to have chondrogenesis or cartilage production and cartilage pr protection benefits. And this study showed that the quality and quantity of the cartilage tissue on MRI was superior with BMAC uh, when it was coupled with microfracture. Other studies demonstrate usefulness as an adjunct in other articular uh, cartilage surgeries like OATS or in using uh, extracellular scaffolds. And in these pictures here, this is a case of mine, uh, a teenage uh, girl who has this cartilage defect in the knee. She was initially treated at an outside institution. Um, the cartilage defect wasn't identified. She went on living with this for a little while, then came to see me and, she, and the cartilage uh, degraded substantially over there on the medial femoral condyle. And we performed an OATS procedure, an osteochondral autograph transfer. So we cleaned up the cartilage defect and then prepared that defect, pouring the, the defect out. And then we took a cartilage uh, transplant using cartilage and bone, a cartilage and bone plug from a non-weight bearing area of the knee. We poured that out and then we implanted it into this weight bearing region of the femoral condyle. And she is now over a year out from surgery and has uh, no pain. She's doing really well. And that's the OATS procedure. And BMAC, like I said, has been shown to be useful as an adjunct in such cartilage surgeries. So BMAC in general, there's some promising results, but more work needs to be done. The mechanism involves connective tissue progenitor cells and some complications or things to consider. There could be post-operative tenderness at the harvest site and certainly financial cost. What about platelet-rich plasma? This is a video uh, describing what platelet-rich plasma is and how we obtain platelet-rich plasma. Our blood consists of a liquid component known as plasma. It also consists of three main solid components, which include red blood cells, RBCs, white blood cells, WBCs, and platelets. Platelets play an important role in forming blood clots. They also consist of special proteins known as growth factors, which help with our body's healing process. Platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, is a high concentration of platelets and plasma. A normal blood specimen contains only 6% platelets, well, platelet-rich plasma contains 94% of platelets and 5 to 10 times the concentration of growth factors found in normal blood, thus greater healing properties. Indications PRP is a relatively new method of treatment for several orthopedic conditions, such as muscle, ligament, and tendon injuries, arthritis, and fractures. 
PRP injections can help alleviate painful symptoms, promote healing, and delay joint replacement surgeries. Procedure. Your doctor will first draw about 10 cc's of blood from a large vein in your elbow. The blood is then spun in a centrifuge machine for about 10 to 15 minutes to separate the platelets from the remaining blood components. The injured part of your body is then anesthetized with a local anesthetic. The platelet-rich portion of your blood is then injected into your affected area. In some cases, your doctor may use ultrasound guidance for proper needle placement. Post-procedural care. It okay. So like you heard, PRP is a blood product that we obtain from the patient themselves. And after we centrifuge it, um, the plasma is separated from the other layers and is concentrated with platelets and other growth factors and other uh, elements like uh, A2M, TGF beta, and others, which we're going to get into. And so there is some controversy about the accurately characterizing PRP preparations, and with the most common being describing PRP as either leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor. This is describing the um, white blood cells in the product, if it's leukocyte rich or white blood cell rich or poor in preparation. And uh, th the reason why this is important is because white blood cells typically produce pro-inflammatory mediators that can lead to increased inflammation. But understanding the effect of inflammation in various tissues is very complex, and the literature has mixed results with regards to PRP treatment. <clears throat> Currently, the data can support use of various PRP formulations in treating knee osteoarthritis. Most studies seem to suggest that a leukocyte-poor PRP is optimal for treatment of early to moderate osteoarthritis of the knee, but there are some that suggest leukocyte-rich formulations can be effective as well. However, more recent data implies that platelet cell count is more important suggesting a minimum of 10 billion platelets per do dose, quote unquote, uh, to be ideal. But even though there's robust data showing that PRP can improve symptoms of osteoarthritis, again, there's little evidence that it actually leads to any functional tissue regeneration in osteoarthritis. This again refers back to the theme of symptom modifying versus structure modifying. There are also current data that support the use of PRP in treating various types of tendinopathy, like that of rotator cuff, elbow extensors, hip abductors, like gluteal tendons, knee patellar tendon, and the Achilles tendon. Both leukocyte poor and leukocyte rich formulations have shown results, although some would say that the leukocyte rich formulations of PRP have more substantial support uh, in the literature. PRP can also augment surgical management of rotator cuff tears or meniscal repairs. There's a system, uh, systematic reviews with objective imaging that have shown tendon healing that PRP can have a positive effect on healing of repaired small to medium-sized rotator cuff tears. It, it also is beneficial in reducing re-tear rates, decreased post-repair uh, pain levels, and increased functional outcome scores when noted, uh, were noted in the study. PRP has shown variable outcomes in meniscal repair studies, and as well as in ACL uh, graft maturation after ACL surgery. Some reporting improved healing, while other studies found no significant difference. So here's the, a case where uh, a male in his 20s soccer athlete came to see me after an ACL injury and he tore his meniscus. Uh, he flew in from out of state after seeing two other orthopedic surgeons that told him his meniscus was toast and uh, that would never be repairable. And he took a chance, came here, and I told him I would give him the best chance I could possibly give. And I, I believe we use PRP uh, in this case, but certainly this was in the setting of ACL reconstruction surgery. And uh, we know from historical literature that with ACL reconstruction, there's increased healing rates of meniscus uh, tissue. And this was a very bad meniscus tear 
um, that most, or at least these other two orthopedic surgeons told them they would not even attempt repair. So this is the video of the repair, and then we have a special surprise at the end. So this is a lateral meniscus tear. You can see there it's a complete tear all the way through across the meniscal tissue, what we call a radial tear that is complete. And you see that the meniscus extrudes outside of the joint when we stress it. This is a very bad tear. And the question is, is this repairable? So we decided to repair this meniscus and give him the best chance at potentiating healing. We repaired it using two figure of eight sutures that we tied with the knots underneath the meniscus to avoid abrasion of the femoral condyle. Here's the second suture going in. So the meniscus was repaired and then we test the repair with a little stress and we see that now the tissue is more stable but we want to protect this repair more so we threw another suture here at the periphery called the peripheral stabilizing suture to help take tension off our repair so that's the final repair there we did the acl reconstruction as well there's the acl graft now Five months later, we came back in his knee because he developed scar tissue in the front that was leading to pain. And look at that meniscus tissue. Healed in, we cannot even see the tissue, the, the sutures that were used to repair. It's a completely healed meniscus. One that was even questionable if it would be repairable. So this is the power um, that uh, regenerative medicine can, uh, can demonstrate in the proper setting. and certainly. Again, it helped that it was in the setting of ACL reconstruction surgery. There has been a growing interest in this uh, alpha-2 macrogoblin. In fact, a question was submitted through our social media announcement, specifically requesting discussion of this. Uh, A2M is a molecule that is concentrated as part of the PRP preparation. Alpha-2 microgoblin is an extracellular macromolecule generally known for its uh, uh, role in inhibiting uh, proteases. So it binds these proteases uh, kind of like a venous flytrap. When it's triggered, it traps them inside like a venous flytrap shown there on the right. And these proteases that it binds, they're linked to tendon and cartilage degeneration after injury or osteoarthritis. During inflammation, A2M aids in minimizing structural damage by inhibiting these proteases that are released and activated by white blood cells in the body. And this is kind of a big deal now in the uh, equine and the vet veterinarian uh, circles these days. It's making big splashes. And so A2M inhibits protease activity by binding them. It also binds other things like cytokines, and certain factors. And A2M has been published recently to show a positive effect in tendon to bone healing in rotator cuff repair. Again, drawing back to the benefits of PRP in rotator cuff repair that we talked about, since A2M is somewhat concentrated in PRP and the reason why there has been a benefit to rotator cuff healing and outcomes after surgery that seems to be suggested in some of these studies. However, at the, the academy guidelines, given numerous publications on PRP and its effect is as follows. So there's, their recommendation is limited with regards to platelet-rich plasma to be used in symptomatic osteoarthritis of the knee, limited recommendations uh, with regards to use in the treatment of rotator cuff tendonitis or partial tears, and strong recommendation uh, regarding limited evidence supporting the use of liquid platelet-rich plasma in the context of decreasing retear rates in the rotator cuff. So in conclusion, there's some promising results, but more work needs to be done. And some future considerations, um, there seems to be new evidence now that exercise can positively influence platelet count in PRP but smoking, NSAIDs, and poor nutrition can negatively influence PRP. The mechanism is an anti-inflammatory one and an immunomodulatory one, and some complications or pertinent negatives are 
mainly financial cost and harvest site injection and pain, or harvest site pain and injection site pain. So PRP can be useful as an adjunct and has been seen to help many patients in my practice, including meniscal repair and healing, tendonitis, and even partial thickness tears of the rotator cuff. Here's another example of a meniscus repair video that was a success, again, in combination with ACL reconstruction in a high school male who injured his knee while playing soccer. This tear is what we call uh, a tear in the red-white zone, so uh, not as much vascularity and healing potential as we'd like. And he did really well after this repair. He's one year out from surgery um, by now um, without any concerns, no joint line pain of the lateral meniscus uh, after this repair and ACL reconstruction. What about hyaluronic acid? Hyaluronic acid is a high molecular weight biomolecule that is found in the synovial fluid of our joints, and it aids in things like joint viscoelasticity, reduction of pain, stimulation of cartilage cells called chondrocytes, and regeneration, as well as anti-inflammatory effect on the joint. Hyaluronic acid can play a biological role in helping stimulate conjoint and sulfate synthesis and cartilage cell proliferation. Studies have reported an anti, uh, an inhibitory effect on joint degrading metalloproteases as well. It was found to be uh, protective of cartilage cells in the rabbit model where full thickness cartilage defects were treated with microfracture and HA. And these findings have also been appreciated in the clinical setting when a comparative study was done in the ankle on hyaluronic acid with microfracture versus microfracture alone. The authors found better outcome scores, pain scores, and higher thickness in tissue remodeling. Moreover, a number of studies have been published on both the usefulness of hyaluronic acid in osteoarthritis treatment, as well as in conjunction with PRP. Now, while HA is covered by many insurance policies, in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, it is controversial to some as a useful tool in non-operative management of osteoarthritis. And the Orthopedic Academy strength of recommendation is moderate for not recommending routine use in knee osteoarthritis. One area of potential upcoming excitement is the idea of hyaluronic acid use in hydrogels or scaffolds. So now in phase three clinical trials, there's products like the Hylofast, which is a 3D scaffold used in combination with BMAC in a single surgical procedure. And some of these studies here seem to be moving in a positive direction with regards to knee cartilage defects. So stay tuned for more on this. Okay, so let's move to micronized adipose tissue. One area of particular interest in regenerative medicine, even outside orthopedics, has been fat or adipose tissue-derived stem cells. They have differentiation potential. They can, uh, they can be involved in adipogenesis, osteogenesis, chondrogenesis, neurogenesis, and that's referring to fat, bone, cartilage, and nerve cells, respectively. Typically, micronized adipose tissue, or MAT, is harvested by lipoaspiration, basically it's liposuction, with the insertion of a cannula with a vacuum syringe into the abdomen to shave out the tissue, and then the aspirate is purged of excessive fluid, and then the tissue is washed with saline. It contains uh, extracellular matrix, uh, microvascular structure, and pericytes. So MAT is the only lipoaspirate formulation approved by the FDA. It contains these adipose-derived stem cells, and it is mechanically processed, not chemically processed or altered, and as such preserves not only these ADSCs intact, but also the surrounding extracellular matrix, the microvasculature, and the pericytes. And this is important for growth factors 
and can also serve as a scaffold at the injection site. The literature is not as prolific as with other orthobiologics and much more work is needed, but here's a pilot study from 2020 and the follow-up study suggesting the use of adipose-derived regenerative cells injected for partial thickness rotator cuff tears leading to improved shoulder function and pain scores without greater risk at the site of injection when they compared it to cortisone injection alone. And the reason why this was done is because cortisone injection uh, is a routine treatment in many orthopedic offices uh, looking to help patients with partial thickness rotator cuff tears. Several studies have notable improvements with excellent patient satisfaction scores when treated with MAT injection and associated with an arthroscopic procedure like uh, that for knee osteoarthritis. Some promising results here as well, but again, more work needs to be done and I hope you uh, sense a theme here. Even though uh, complications are rare, there's few studies that report postoperative abdominal pain, swelling, bruising, and low risk of infection in the immediate postoperative period. Okay, let's move on to extracellular matrix scaffolds. So human tissue repair can be improved with scaffolds that act as physical support to tissue healing. There is a number of extracellular matrix scaffolds available to augment things like tendon repair and meniscal replacement surgery. These scaffolds are of synthetic versus human versus animal sources and can be either permanent or resorbable. And what's nice about these scaffolds is that they can serve as biomechanical as well as biological functions at, uh, the, at the uh, place of implantation and during surgery. They can serve as materials uh, with enough strength and stiffness to load share the native tissue and tendons, so it serves as protecting the repair, but also as a structure for cells to stick and grow onto and produce new tissue. And on, there, on the right there is an Achilles tendon repair that we performed using uh, such an extracellular matrix, and the patient did extremely well. This was because they had a chronic tear uh, that was uh, not diagnosed, and then when they came to finally see us, um, when we got in, the tendon uh, was too um, retracted and uh, would not come together, so we had to use the scaffold to augment that repair. And ideally, these scaffolds would absorb over time, but the challenge here is the timing of this resorption to match the formation of new tissue. Another nice aspect of scaffolds is that they could potentially be infused before implantation with biologic factors like signaling molecules, which then stimulate migration of the patient cells into the scaffold to, and they could potentially mute an immune response to the material. One area of future interest could be 3D printing, of patient-specific cells and matrix materials to build specific shapes and viable tissue implants. Okay, let's move on to future outlooks now. So cells derived from perinatal tissue could potentially be another avenue for orthobiologics in the future umbilical cord, blood, Wharton jelly, amniotic membrane and fluid, and placental tissues are the types that we're discussing here. Currently, these elements can only be used in clinical trials under an IND application. And this is because these perinatal components represent non-patient derived or non-homologous use. And previously, these cells have been marketed to have viable cells, which would be in violation of that section 361. Another source of potential investigation could be connective tissue progenitor cells, or MSCs derived from bursal tissue. A bursa is a fluid-filled sac that allows more smooth gliding of tendons, ligaments, and bones across each other's surface. One study found that cells obtained from subacromial bursa in the shoulder showed some qualities of progenitor cells, and currently preclinical studies 
in mice are showing a positive effect on rotator cuff tendon repair. Another future area of investigation is better understanding ways to stimulate and activate these previously discussed pericytes to induce tissue regeneration. Okay, what about exosomes? Exosomes are vesicles that are released by cells in our body. They basically are subcellular containers that ship products like protein, lipids, nucleic acids, uh, like microRNA, mRNA, and DNA. And they release these contents outside the cell to regulate musculoskeletal activity. They would be of benefit to potentially stimulate regeneration of tissue without the need to harvest cells like adipose tissue and then expand these cells like in other applications and then implant them uh, back in the patient. Preclinical studies have yielded positive effects on rotator cuff tissue so far. They are currently under active research, but no FDA approved products are yet available. And lastly, gene therapy. As we know, cells in our bodies contain DNA with genetic information, and genes are turned on and off based on the need to express those products based on the organ in which those cells reside. Gene therapy techniques can be used to block or suppress expression of certain genes. For example, we may uh, like those in normally expressed uh, disease tissue that we may want to suppress, or alternatively, they can be used to promote prolonged expression of certain genes, like let's say in biologically normal tissue, for example, um, to um, inhibit anti, so to have an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, to promote angiogenesis, which is the formation of arteries, and to bring blood flow to regions that need healing. The most common gene therapy approach today uses a virus, like an adeno-associated virus, AAV, to basically infect cells with the desired genetic information. But one problem with this approach is the possible immune response that patients can have against this virus. So currently there are other viral and non-viral approaches being studied, in addition to pathways that we can use to suppress the immune system using drugs. Currently, there are clinical trials using some alternative methods to aid in gene therapy, and there is an FDA-approved gene therapy treatment available for treatment of spinal muscular atrophy in children two years of age and under. So in conclusion, treatment in the field of regenerative medicine that orthopedic surgeons use is called orthobiologics. This refers to therapies developed from biologic tissue and substances that can be used to help relieve pain and other symptoms, enhance the body's ability to heal, and in some cases improve healing after orthopedic surgery. Some of the more common orthobiologics available and discussed tonight include concentrated bone marrow aspirate, platelet-rich plasma, hyaluronic acid, micronized adipose tissue, extracellular matrix scaffolds, while some future endeavors can include exosomes, cell, and gene therapy. Although orthobiologics have tremendous potential, the theme is more work is needed. We need better characterization of biologic activity and biologic formulations in these modalities, treatment modalities, we need better characterization of the pathologic tissue that we're addressing. We need better, uh, better characterize and quantify the desired outcome. And this will hopefully lead to more specific matching of regenerative medicine treatment to the patient-specific pathology to yield more consistent results and lead to better outcomes. So thank you for your time and for being here tonight. All right, thank you, Dr. Q. Wow, <laughs> that was a lot of great information. I will admit a fair amount of it went over my head, but your descriptions and, and how you really tried to kind of bring it down to the level of the layperson is, is greatly appreciated. Um, we've got a few questions here and, and I'll be honest and upfront, I'm not even sure these are questions related to 
what you spoke about because again some of it went over my head so if you if you say yeah karen that's not really something that i'm familiar with or that that i have experience with you can just go ahead and say next <laughs> all right we'll do our best okay super um so someone asks is there any experience for prp with patients that have blood cancer this particular person has been in remission for five years from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and is considering PRP for chronic inflammation in the bursa of their hip. And then she goes on to say, is there any reason not to have PRP in relation to stage five kidney disease? So again, we can't speak to specifics. Um, everybody needs to consult with their uh, orthopedic surgeon and uh, general practitioner uh, in this field. Um, the, the problem where this would come into play is again, the platelet-rich plasma doesn't contain only platelets, it contains um, white blood cells. Now, you know, if, if the patient is in remission and there's those white blood cells uh, that are presumed to be the cancer uh, cells uh, in the past, you know, if they're in remission and those cells are normal, you know, that's that's something that uh, may be perfectly plausible. However, there's always risk that this could uh, potentially turn into something else. Certainly in active cancer patients, uh, that would be something that, like of uh, Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, that would be a, a consideration um, to, to avoid. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this person, um, has a partial tear in their shoulder and doesn't want to surgery or to miss their gym training. And they wanna know, would PRP be covered by insurance or would it be an out-of-pocket expense? Yeah, so for the reasons we discussed tonight and the reason why I was smiling when you asked that question is because that is such a common uh, example. Um, the, the, for the reasons that we covered tonight with the uh, results being, um, you know, all over. Uh, right. In many instances, uh, insurances do not uh, cover PRP injections under their policy. However, uh, Tricare, which is uh, insurance for active military members, now does cover PRP wow. uh, injections because they've come to uh, see the benefits of PRP in the young active population that they uh, have in their healthcare system. Got it. And do you think that this is something that as more trials are done, insurance companies will hop on board the same way physicians will hop on board because they, they see good results if, if, in fact, these clinical trials demonstrate positive results? Yeah, so that's what we hope for, right? And, th and that's part of the problem is, is better streamlining the results to, to identify those, those things that we need to show effectiveness, consistency, and outcomes uh, that we want uh, the insurance companies to be able to, to stand before the evidence. And then once we have that uh, evidence to then offer it as a potential treatment for patients. Great, and, and I'm wondering for you, um, as a, a physician in sports medicine and orthopedics, how did you get interested in biologics and orthobiologics? I mean, it's just it's just fascinating to think, you know, the 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 potential there is just tremendous, um, and you know, the potential to unlock solutions for some of the uh, more difficult problems in orthopedics. The 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 prospect of that is just a a fascinating one. So it just basically leads into it, like, wow, this is just so interesting, and the possibilities could potentially be sort of endless. Yeah, the human, the human uh, body, the human's body uh, ability to to heal um, when it's unleashed can can be an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds like they're finding more and more ways that it heals in in tissues that they didn't realize had healing potential. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, someone asks uh, if if they have asthma and take ad, take Advair and Singular. Does that impact PRP and are there clinical trials for PRP um, when people are taking these types of medications? I am not familiar with the literature uh, if it does include um, data on that, um, but certainly, you know, all things considered, yeah, I could be. Yeah, 
And, and can can lay people like me or or the people that are here tonight can we find the these um, these clinical trials? So I mean, if we're talking about PRP, um, yeah, and um, I even put up the the link for the stem cell uh, clinical trials. If anybody's interested, those are available um, on that link that we provided. So yeah, I mean, even Google searches can can uh, yield. Uh, enough literature to make you dizzy let's just say that <laughs> fair enough all righty very good um let's see someone wants to know if there are pills of hyaluronic acid so yes um they are over-the-counter supplements and um the problem with that is that they don't get absorbed the hyaluronic acid is a large molecule and it doesn't get absorbed in the GI, uh, so the gastrointestinal system like we'd like. And it's akin to, uh, I believe someone was once quoted as saying it's it's as effective as taking hair pills for male pattern baldness. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Without, without um, a direct injection into the knee for which it's approved, for example. Um, you know, the, the, the prospect of, of anybody getting a significant amount of hyaluronic acid from a pill, it's not going to happen. Yeah, it's just not going to get there. Okay, thank you. Um, someone else asks, could PRP or HA help with essential tremors? Has there been any, re any research into that, do you know? Not that I know of. Okay. This is, you know, we try to stay within our bounds, and as orthopedic surgeons, you know, we we need to stay within our lane. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I, I, I got guessed, but I thought, well, if someone asks, I'll ask. I, um, I'm not aware of any. Okay, fair enough, yeah. Um, someone asks if possibly you could put up slide three again with the URL for the clinical trials. So Ryan, would it be possible to, to allow Dr. Q to access that? For the stem cells? The stem cell clinical trials? Uh, it was it was slide three, so I think that was the stem cell clinical trials. I, I don't think slide three is that. Okay, so it must have been it must have been the stem cell clinical trials. Thank you. That slide three. Yeah, that I, that wasn't it. I believe this is the one that they there are. There it is. Yep. yep, there it is. So probably if you did a Google search on clinicaltrials.gov or through the National Institute of Health, someone could probably find it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we've got two minutes left. I've got another good question. How do you determine? whether a patient is a candidate for a regenerative approach? Well, that's a very broad uh, question. It, it comes down to the specific uh, problem that we're treating and the um, available and already used treatment options that we've employed in treating that a specific problem. And so you basically, is it just an individual approach to each person? okay, this is what's happening with them. You know, for example, you were talking about the meniscal repair with the ACL repair, and that's an opportunity to get in there and uh, and, and do some good. So it just basically it's individual situations. Yeah, you know, you, you go into surgery with the experience that you have, um, with the knowledge from the literature that you hopefully have ascertained, um, and it's constantly changing obviously and then you a lot of times you have to make a decision when we're talking about surgery at the point of care certainly in the clinic it's a little bit different when you're talking with the patient who's undergone treatment a b c and d well another option potentially could be an avenue in regenerative medicine um, and if that's something that's available to them um, and they want to consider it um, you know and, and there's there's some some evidence to support it 
um, you know, that could be a discussion. And obviously the risks and the benefits need to be weighed individually. Right, right. And are you finding many that, um, what percentage-ish of patients are interested in regenerative medicine when, when they're, you know, when, when you present it to them? Mm, I mean, it varies. It's very hard to put a, a number on it. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, there will be yeah. some months where every day I get asked, you know, a number of questions on, and there'll be days where I don't, I don't get much uh, interest. So, so it, so it just depends on the like what, how much people have learned about it, what they've seen on television, what kind of ads they've read about. Got yes, it. and what problem they have, and then also again the financial burden um, with insurance companies not uh, offering them as part of their policy um, is definitely um, puts a, a, a burden on the patient. Right, right. Very good. All right. Well, we have gone past our hour, and I don't want to keep you any longer than uh, than than possible. If you have specific questions, folks, please reach out to Dr. Q. His information is on the screen. Dr. Q, thank you so, so much for trying to bring this really uh, intellectual topic down to lay terms so that we can understand as much as we can about it. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for your research, and thank you for all you're doing for those of us who have challenges in our bodies. Have Thank a great you. evening, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Q. Bye-bye.